It is Friday, March 31st. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back to another fine episode of LTPS. We've got a lot of PlayStation news stories to go over. So first, as always, our PS Plus reminder. This is your last call for the March PS Plus Essential Games Grab them before they go away. April 4th, it's going to change over to Meet Your Maker on PS4 and PS5. And that's a day one launch, uh, launching into PS Plus. Also, Sackboy Big Adventure, PS4, PS5, and Tales of Iron on PS4 and PS5 as well. I feel like this is one of the first times where we've had uh, all PS4 and PS5 native versions being offered. So good that we're finally getting to that point uh at least more often if this is not the first time this has happened but um yeah we've got a damn one launch in here we've also got Sackboy, which i think was eventually going to hit ps plus at some point kind of surprised it did not hit ps plus extra or premium first well it would hit extra before it hits premium but um yeah, surprised that was not an extra beforehand, but that's fine. It's a really fun game. Uh, in fact, I feel kind of bad because like a long time ago when that game was first revealed, I'm like, oh, okay, so it's like a 3D world. I don't want to say ripoff, but you know, that's kind of what I was getting at, right? But it's it's actually so fun. And so I feel like that game is heavily slept on and Tales of Iron also looks pretty cool as well. Moving on to our first news story, we have a new PS5 system software update. This one was 23.01.07.01.01. An issue in the game library where content was displayed incorrectly under certain conditions was resolved. So nothing uh, really mind-blowing or crazy, exceptional, not even an improvement to the overall system performance, which is quite frankly vastly disappointing. Moving on to our next news story, we have a new Bloomberg report coming from the writer Takashi Mochizuki claiming PSVR 2 sales are off to a not very good underwhelming start. So PSVR 2 has apparently so far only sold about 270,000 units since its February 22nd launch. This is coming from the research firm IDC where they do some guesswork but also market analysis to come to their conclusion. And so they're claiming that PSVR 2 is in a not great situation uh but they phrase it as them needing to give this thing a price cut soon before they can uh, well in order to avoid a quote complete disaster is what they're calling it so really painting this in a in a dire situation and i i think the thing to sort of address right away because i know some of some are bringing this up but it's the matter of this particular writer that has you know done a lot of stories throughout the past few years on Sony's business and oftentimes it's <laughs> it's not really a, a good news story when they write about Sony but more recently it was about the PSVR 2 production timeline that Sony was planning to make about 2 million units for the launch window then they had to cut those production targets in half because the pre-orders weren't doing that well and then Sony had to come out and respond and say that's not true and but it's that cat and mouse game between you know the press and, and Sony as a big company so you know I wouldn't put too much stock into that outside of a, a reporter that feels they in good faith have a, a source that they can trust and they're running with a bunch of these stories I mean that's just how it goes obviously um, and Sony can't always can't always take their word for it either because of course they're going to try and deny uh, things that paint them in a negative light so um you always got to tread carefully with both sides, but it is something where uh, that number isn't really awful per se. This is the problem with PSVR 2 sales in general, and we talked about this a while ago, which is no matter what number gets put out there, I think it's probably going to be seen as bad because it is going to be a low number because this is a low volume device. That much is certain. So if we can judge it correctly under the, you know, under the right parameters, then we can maybe, you know, look at that number more critically. Now, I'm not sure Sony will even <laughs> tell us how well it'll do anytime soon. I mean, the best chance, of course, is uh, during financial reports, but they don't really have to tell us exactly how it did either. They got to tell shareholders something, so <laughs> they might not put numbers out there, but it's just we don't know exactly how how well this thing is doing. Now, if 270K is true, that doesn't seem awful to me. I would have expected it to do better though, just based on, again, those correct parameters of how do we judge this thing appropriately? Well, we look at PSVR 1, that was from 2016 to 17, where it took about nine months for that headset to reach 1 million sold. So, I mean, but there's just so much more time to go, right? And we've got different things going on here as well. It is, expense, uh, it is expensive, there's no backwards compatibility, which I think doesn't really hurt it nearly as much as some might imply, but it's expensive during you know uncertain economic times. 
Uh, you can only get it on PlayStation Direct. Um, not a whole lot of marketing, but they are marketing enough to where they're reaching the audience that this thing is for, right? Because it is a very niche device. So I think there's not much to be said right now on how PSVR 2 may or may not do. But just bear in mind, when we do get a number, it is going to be small. And if we judge it correctly, then we can maybe come to a better conclusion on just how well it's doing. Now, having said that, there is still good news when it comes to sales, and that means PS5 itself, because that's the running two-year trend here, is that PS5, when it's available, does very well. So this is coming from Matt Piscatella of the, well, formerly MPD group, but it recently merged with uh, MPD and IRI merged to form Circana, so now it's called Circana. And, uh, well, recently, Matt Piscatella of Circana was asked on Twitter, you know, how well did PS5 do in February? And so um, he did confirm that PS5 has set a new record for the most PlayStation sold in a February in the U.S. So, yeah, they're doing very well. And uh, on a related note for PS5 sales, the company has also cut the price officially in India. So both the disc and digital edition seeing a 5,000 rupee discount bringing it down to the launch prices before the increase last year. Um, another thing to mention with the, uh, like last week, the discount that is being offered on the Ragnarok bundle, which is very much available at most retailers. Uh, they are doing that sort of end of quarter push here. So March is almost over. So that would also explain why they're being a bit aggressive on wanting to get a lot of consoles out there. But uh, they have a very aggressive sales target for this quarter of about 6 million, 6.2 million or something. So that will be uh, interesting to see just how close they get to that number because they had a lot of ground to make up. Now, going back to bad news, The Last of Us Part 1 on PC recently launched, and uh, it did not do very good. A lot of performance issues, bugs, glitches, weird visual oddities. Yeah, this game uh, was released in a, in a pretty poor state, and that led to you know, thousands of negative Steam reviews. Um, and Naughty Dog has already responded saying that they're aware of the concerns and are investigating all the issues, which, you know, since the uh, since launch, they've already they've already released two hot fixes, um, which seem to be helping some people, but not everybody, you know, granted the game just came out, so they're not going to address every, every problem that quickly, but it seems like they are certainly trying to stay on top of it. Um, now, before we talk about that, we should also move into the next story, which is uh, Naughty Dog's Vice President Christian Gerling wrote a new blog post celebrating the PC release of the game, uh, talking about how the game and the engine were made for PS5, but they wanted to optimize and make a, a, a really good PC version. Um, and they, make a, they also make the commitment of more PC releases, where Christian says, and I quote here, so, where will the next Naughty Dog development adventure take us? Rest assured, PlayStation and PC players were already looking forward to sharing more. Whether you prefer a DualSense controller or a keyboard and mouse, developing for both platforms empowers us to incorporate lessons learned from either into the overall design of our games. Sharing our stories and experiences on PS5 as well as PC is something that Naughty Dog has embraced and will continue to support moving forward. So I guess to address Christian's comments first, we can say that there's not really... There's not really a story here. I know a lot of folks are talking about it like it's a big deal because this is Naughty Dog openly embracing PC and, you know, what does that mean? And I also know not everyone sees all the news as it comes out, but we did already catch wind of exactly how Sony is going to be approaching this when it comes to this, you know, second wave of PS Studio titles in the PS5's back half life cycle, right? Um, the head of PS Studios has already outlined live service games are expected to launch day and date with PC versions because they're live service games, they're gonna have they're gonna have cross-platform play, and that makes sense for what they're doing. Single player games will still launch on PS5 first and then have a PC port one, two years later. There's gonna be a slight delay. That's at least what we were told and that's likely what we should be expecting. And so in the context of Naughty Dog when they're talking about embracing PC, what does that mean? That means the Last of Us multiplayer, we should absolutely expect a day one PC version of that game that should not be a surprise when it finally gets a formal reveal although i'm sure it still will be surprising to some but that is very much what we should be looking forward to and then when they do their big next big single player game that's probably going to be ps5 only but um going back to part one's 
you know, really bad PC launch. I mean, this is surprising and not surprising. Uh, surprising in that it's Naughty Dog, so there is that expectation that if they were going to do this PC port in-house, which they did, that's what this blog post is detailing with moving their engine over and everything. So Iron Galaxy did play a role in supporting, but this was mostly in-house for Naughty Dog because they do have to work on that dev pipeline to start accommodating for a eventual, or in this case for The Last of Us multiplayer, a day one PC port, right? They have to start working towards that so even with a delay on this game it's surprising that they launched the game in the state that it is i just i don't really know how they fumbled the bag on this one um, but it's also unsurprising in that there are going to be growing pains for a studio that it's been, that's been primarily doing you know console dev for <laughs> a very long time decades even they've done pc but that was a long long time ago so and that's that goes for all the ps studio developers right so there's growing pains that's that doesn't really uh make it okay but at least they're aware of the issues and hopefully they'll address most of the big ones very quickly Moving on to some new details for the Horizon Forbidden West Burning Shores DLC, we've got a much better idea now of how this content is going to play out, and it does look a lot different from what we normally expect out of the Horizon gameplay loop, based on one new machine they showed off called the Water Wing, which is a mid-sized flying mount that you can also use underwater. So they showed that alongside the uh, announcement that they're moving to a voxel-based rendering system for their volumetric clouds, which kind of goes into another reason why this content is not on PS4. So the, that adds up and, uh, you know, the clouds are going to look uh, much more dynamic and lifelike. But it's really this gameplay clip that they shared. It's, you know, small, but it showcases what I think they're going for in this content, which is... Uh, trying to utilize two things that were underutilized in the base game. That's the underwater sections and the flying. Now, you don't get the mount until much later in the game, which was uh, kind of disappointing, right? So having the mount early on, right, have more, an em have more of an emphasis on using it, but also being able to travel underwater so fast makes the underwater sections actually explorable. Like, there's things underwater in Forbidden West, but I did not really do them... I didn't really explore them because Aloy's slow under there and she's kind of very vulnerable, right? With how much dangerous stuff is down there. So uh, perhaps they're really trying to change this in a big way with this content. And perhaps it's also giving us an inside look into how they're shaping the next entry in the series, which I do think needs to make some bold steps in how it's played uh, from beginning to end. So with how much verticality they're exploring, that's really new for Horizon. So uh, now I'm like a lot more interested in Burning Shores than I was before. Next up, we have a uh, peculiar tease going on for God of War, where recently during a God of War PAX East panel, uh, Tyr's voice actor, Ben Prendergast, said this is not the last we've seen of Tyr, and that's all he said, which means now we can speculate, and I think what we can safely speculate is that can mean a lot, <laughs> because it doesn't necessarily mean it's another game, it could also mean, you know, some, well, side content, not necessarily. We were already told point blank that we should not expect any additional side content for God of War Ragnarok, but like side content in other media, maybe they're doing a comic book, a mini series. We know there's a God of War TV show. So I think we should not let imaginations run too wild here. Uh, but I think in some way, shape or form, maybe we'll see more tear. Now moving on to some Gran Turismo news, uh, GT7 recently got a patch 1.31, which adds new cars, tracks, a few other changes, but uh, most notably it also adds a 120Hz high frame rate mode, uh, VRR enabled, so always nice when another PS Studio game in the back catalog gets that high frame rate mode. And also, uh, kind of a weird thing, but Gran Turismo 4, so uh, recently the Twitter user at Nenkai discovered cheat codes in this game nearly 20 years later. So in order for these to work, you have to let 365 in-game days pass, but afterwards you can punch these in and then you can automatically unlock 10 million credits or pass the license test or get gold in any event. So that's always a, a weird thing to see. This does happen occasionally, and sometimes I'm a little wary because we've had situations where these just get publicized again, but they were known at the time. So I don't know if they were really discovered 20 years later, but it does happen. Uh, and it, it also is a, 
a bleak reminder that we don't do like cheat codes are not a thing anymore not the kind of like enter in all these random buttons on a menu and you unlock a secret thing or a weird gun or just a bunch of guns or infinite ammo and money we just don't really have that stuff anymore. The new cheat codes nowadays are either a debug menu that's easily user accessible or accessibility settings which are there to you know serve a different purpose versus what cheat codes did 20 years ago. Now we've got an update here for the PS5 timed exclusive remake of Silent Hill 2 where if you remember last week's episode we talked about how the Bloober team president said the game was you know nearly done to the point where it's not like totally finished but you know it's something where Konami and Sony it's up to them on when they want to confirm the release date and eventually launch the game and now we've got Bloober team sending out a tweet where they're addressing inaccuracies regarding certain sales forecasts for specific titles but also saying quote it is also not true that we have announced that Silent Hill 2 is ready for release pretty much going completely against the word of what the president recently said and we can't exactly chalk that all up to mistranslations and being taken out of context it was still pretty forward about how hey the game is nearly done and that decision is not up to us on when we release it so i don't really know what's going on here outside of them maybe trying to cover up what was you know very clearly info that wasn't meant to go out it wasn't really all that explicit either just that yeah we might be able to expect the game by the end of this year assuming that the you know what's left of the game is it's kind of smooth sailing from this point forward which that is always not really guaranteed but the speculation still stands that we could maybe see a new release date trailer show up within the next few months at perhaps a PlayStation showcase, which is not confirmed, but we are expecting Sony to start talking fairly soon. So for this week, we don't really have a major update in the Microsoft ABK situation, but we do have something kind of similar, which is the Activision CEO Bobby Kotick recently sending an email to employees, letting them know he's not very happy with Sony's recent behavior. So when bringing up Sony's recent arguments about how the company may release, you know, buggy, inferior versions of their games on their platforms, he acknowledges that and says in this email, and I quote, all of us who work so hard to deliver the best games in our industry care too deeply about our players to ever launch subpar versions of our games. Sony has even admitted that they aren't actually concerned about a Call of Duty agreement, they would just like to prevent our merger from happening. This is obviously disappointing behavior from a partner for almost 30 years, but we will not allow Sony's behavior to affect our long-term relationship. PlayStation players know we will continue to deliver the best games possible on Sony's platforms, as we have since the launch of PlayStation. This is probably a good time to address the one conversation that keeps going on during this entire process, and that's that Sony is creating all this bad blood between them and Microsoft, them and Activision, and so based on the results of this merger, you know, one or both of them could retaliate, and uh, that's certainly true to an extent, uh, and we've actually got a story coming up that's kind of in that same area, but uh, generally we can look at, you know, how these companies all, the relationship they all have with one another, and know that there are certain things that are simply not going to happen so for example if activision had to remain independent you know they, they don't really have a choice i mean they're not going to severely diminish their own bottom line willingly because they want to spite sony for ruining the merger not going to happen sony's still going to get call of duty uh, and also whether sony does or does not accept an agreement we know that microsoft very much sort of has to right now ship call of duty on playstation even after the merger finishes uh, so you know we had the news last week that the cma no longer considers console competition as a an area of uh, an area of concern now they are still looking at cloud gaming <clears throat> so it's still not a guarantee although it's certainly that's a big hurdle that they're now over so it's looking much better but the point is um you know, knowing that they are likely on their way to approval for the entire thing, and Sony still has not accepted a Call of Duty agreement, that was the talking point, was that, oh, now they don't have to offer anything, but that's not true. They likely still have to make concessions with or without Sony. They're making the concessions to the regulators, but they are highly incentivized <clears throat> to still keep releasing Call of Duty for now. It, it has always been more a matter of what is the serious long-term you know, repercussions to this kind of consolidation where they very much might be able to at some point foreclose on Sony and that will dramatically change things. But, you know, that's all speculation, obviously. 
at least for right now, with Activision, not really much concern with them, you know, willingly taking away Call of Duty or anything like that. But yes, they are certainly, you know, uh, burning some bridges that uh, they might they may not be able to use in the future. Now, the really interesting thing is the tables turning on Sony because we've got both political parties here in the U.S. writing letters and applying pressure to the Biden administration about Sony's dominance on console in Japan. <laughs> so they cite a 98% market share in the high-end console space, which would obviously exclude PC and Nintendo Switch. Now, they're mostly bringing this up because they claim Sony is stifling a U.S. company's ability to compete in Japan uh, in that market, and they mention Sony has been signing deals designed to keep Japanese games from Microsoft's Xbox, which may violate Japan's antitrust laws. And a Microsoft spokesperson has already said they welcome this discussion, but they aren't outright explaining how involved they were in this push. Uh, Axios is reporting that Microsoft has indeed talked with members of Congress regarding this issue, with Stephen Totillo mentioning six of the 10 senators who are pressing this issue are from Washington, which is Microsoft's home state, and Microsoft is the biggest political donor to, uh, to Senator Maria Cantwell, who initially brought this forward to the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. And also, just as a very good timing here, but Japan's FTC did recently approve the ABK merger. Now, I am perplexed because is this really the one thing that Microsoft chose to jumpstart as a way of like, hey, thanks for all the ABK trouble, Sony. Like, this is what we'll focus on. Like, is this really, this is it? I don't know. It's just, it's weird because like we've seen plenty of bad faith arguments from both Sony and Microsoft during the, during the entire ABK process. They both did it. Uh, but some arguments were good between both again. And this is bad, you know, like they use the 98% figure while well, the senators do. Um, and they do categorize it as the high end console space. And that is Sony and Microsoft. That's exactly how it was categorized with the CMA, the FTC. And so that is, you know, fair game. And that's how they came to that 98% number, because this is Japan where Microsoft has hardly any presence. Um, so maybe it was just kind of an easy target, but, uh, you know, Japan is also a different market with the high-end console space, as in it's not nearly as big in the U.S. and Europe and the U.K., so uh, it does have to be examined differently if we want to really humor this, but it's just, it's <laughs> strange because, sure, Sony has signed agreements for, you know, Final Fantasy, but for the vast majority in terms of sheer volume of Japanese games that come out, I mean, they a lot of these publishers and developers willingly skip Xbox because it's been a 20-year cultural thing of consumers just not wanting Xbox. Like, there's just really no getting around it. There, there, there's simply no getting around the, the sort of consumer preference of if people are going to buy a console that's not Nintendo at this point in Japan, they're usually picking up a PlayStation. I, I don't know what the end game is on this one. <laughs> That's, I don't know, I, I guess we'll watch this and see what happens, but that was uh, really surprising to me. Next up, E3 is officially dead, or at least we assume so. Uh, one of those things where E3 2023 recently died, and we don't know if their life counter hitting zero means that they're actually done, or if zero means they'll respawn one more time. But the point is, uh, it seems like they're basically done because the way this played out was Ubisoft, who originally did confirm that they would be there, they pulled out only to confirm that they would still be in Los Angeles June 12th for a Ubisoft Forward Live event. And then we had IGM reports saying that Sega and Tencent are also pulling out. And then there's been you know, anecdotes left and right during GDC that most companies don't know if they're going to be there or they already know they aren't. And then the ESA confirmed that yes, E3 2023 is canceled. The email they sent out to e, uh, the email they sent out to ESA members didn't say anything about future E3 events, but the statement they did give to IGN and also GamesIndustry.biz implied that they would be looking at future events. Uh, and also, Jeff Keighley is out here living his best life with the Summer Games Fest. So RIP E3, uh, it does seem like it's pretty much done, especially because this was supposed to be the reset event. You know what I mean? Like they were, this was supposed to be the year that they were trying to understand what E3 was going to be. 
now that they don't have the allure of a standard trade show where business deals happen. You know, a lot of, you know, deals behind the scenes happen at GDC now, right? Um, and retail stuff is not really a huge thing anymore. And then when it comes to the marketing announcements, you know, all publishers and platform holders, they can do that much cheaper on their own terms with live streams and blog posts and Twitter and things like that. So this was supposed to be the year that E3 was supposed to understand what it looks like now. And they didn't even get a chance to do that. So I think it's done, which maybe that's for the best. Uh, you know, I, I would have loved to go to E3. I think a lot of folks always think that, uh, but I don't know. I mean, the E3 that I would have wanted to go to was long gone anyway, because uh, that was a while ago where like the press conferences weren't even for consumers. It was like a third for consumers, a third for retailers, and a third for shareholders. Like that's <laughs> like back when E3 was like that. I think it would have been cool to at least for one year, like seriously work the event, network, do all those meetings and, and stuff like that, and do some writing and, and covering the event. I think that would have been uh, quite the experience, but E3 just has not has not been that for a long time now. So, you know, E3 obviously can't really adapt into how news is delivered and how deals are done nowadays. And so, yeah, RIP E3. It was certainly a good memory. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below, supporting this channel a number of ways and gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories from this past week that I uh, wanted to talk about through all. And uh, we also did not have any Tuesday video, had a lot going on, so trying to catch up. Uh, hopefully we'll be back on track, but uh, I can at least briefly mention as a small little PSA here, but for those that didn't really want to ever use Patreon, but you are willing to support, which is always greatly appreciated. I finally got around to turning on that YouTube join button. So there's some, you know, little badges and whatnot. But more importantly, I was able to make sure that all the extra bonus content that's on Patreon, the deleted scenes, the um, uncut videos, unreleased, you know, failed videos, all that stuff is here on YouTube as the as bonus content for channel members as well. So it's not quite the same thing, but you get the same videos. Um, so if you wanna just support here, that is an option now. Again, you don't have to, but we don't do sponsorships or anything on the channel. It's all primarily uh, just baked in YouTube ad driven. So if you do support, always greatly appreciated and very humbling, but it's now an option just uh, letting you all know. But otherwise, that's it. Hopefully this coming Tuesday, we should be back on track. Anyway, uh, that concludes this week's episode of Lust Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.